If you're new here, hi, nice to meet you. Uh, I got a haircut recently and it looks like a cross between the hairstyle that Ellen had in the 90s and the wig that Jenny Nicholson wore in her Dear Evan Hansen video. I'm doing fine. If we're not new, this is going to be a little bit different than the kind of video that I've typically posted on my channel. This is part one of a multi-video series of Gravity Falls analyses videos that will be released leading up to June 18th, 618 the Gravity Falls number. These videos will be a bit more condensed, a bit shorter, and with a bit less production than my capital V, capital E video essays. So if you like this, but you want something with more dynamic lighting and costumes, then maybe something akin to Philosophy 2, but on a middle school play budget, then you can check out past videos on this channel. Still, welcome to Project 618. Today, we're going to talk about alternate universes. We need to talk about parallel universes. And basically about the various Gravity Falls AUs that have influenced an entire generation of fans' appreciation of the series. If you don't know what Gravity Falls is, I don't know, man. <laughs> this might not be the video for you. You might want to check out Wikipedia or something? I don't know. We're not going to go into the basics here. But after you've checked that out, come back, okay? Some of you might be familiar with the kinds of established fandom AU genres that we typically see in fan art and fan fiction. Things like coffee shop AUs, or high school AUs, or soulmate AUs. And while you see these tropes play out predominantly in other fandoms, the biggest AUs in the Gravity Falls fandom work a little bit differently. It starts with an idea, usually on Tumblr, well, basically almost always on Tumblr, and someone makes a post like, what if instead of ABC happening, XYZ happened instead? Wouldn't it be interesting if Stan and Ford both fell through the portal? Wouldn't it be interesting if Dipper was a demon? Wouldn't it be interesting if everyone was a furry? And it builds, and people add story beats and different dimensions to it, and soon the AU has a fully-fledged established canon. Or, well, a fanon. If you follow me on Tumblr, you might know that I put out a poll recently, listing all of the Gravity Falls AUs that I could remember. It was me trying to find out which ones were the most popular and which ones I definitely had to talk about in this video. And if you're in the Gravity Falls fandom and you're looking at this list and thinking, I have no idea what the fuck these even are, guess what? You're not alone, <laughs> these goddamn new Gravity Falls fans. You children don't know your history. And those who don't know their history are doomed to repeat it. And god damn it, I can't live through Will Cipher a second time. So we're gonna look at these AUs one at a time, and we're gonna take a look at where they came from, who made them, what they were, and how they changed the landscape of the Gravity Falls fandom. Before we jump into the list, some disclaimers. Number one, sources were hard to track down for this. Like I mentioned, everything was posted on Tumblr, and Tumblr is notoriously difficult to find things on. I did my best, but a lot of these blogs had deactivated or changed names, and it was just tough to find everything. But I put in sources where I could find them. If I misattributed something to someone and you know who was the real creator, please put it down in the comments and I will update the description below. Number two, I don't know everything about all these AUs, and Tumblr is a big place. I analyzed these both based on what I could find for research in this video and what I could recall, but for, I don't know, an AU where there's an established canon that involves a lot of established lore and a ton of OCs and a tons of things that you gotta remember and their own timelines, I might not have it all 100% correct. I will link to blogs and wikis associated with those fandoms down below. Number three, Mystery Trio is not going to be mentioned in this video, mostly because it began as a theory and then just kind of became an AU after it was decided that it wasn't ever going to be canon. R.I.P. But also because I have an entire video planned on Mystery Trio and like a real one, like a big one, not one of these small dinky 20 minute things. So we'll get to Mystery Trio, just not in this video. Number four, problematic? <laughs> I'm going to be giving my opinion on some of these things as well as elements of some of these plots that I might find a bit problematic. But what I'm not going to be doing is listing out issues with any specific creator. If I credit someone for an AU idea and that person is problematic in any way, um, just know that I'm not crediting them because I'm endorsing every problematic thing they've ever done. I'm crediting them because they came up with the AU idea and because it made an impact on fandom. Could you give us some of your political beliefs? Kill everyone now. Condone first degree murder. Advocate cannibalism. Eat shit. Filth are my politics. Filth is my life. Take whatever you like. Lastly, 
spoiler warning and content warning for all of these AUs. Um, some of these AUs are a bit more edgy and gritty. Uh, some include eyeball trauma specifically. If you know what I'm talking about, you know which one I'm talking about. Uh, so proceed with caution. Um, these are all the trigger warnings. And of course, spoiler alert for all of these AUs. Okay, I think that's everything. Let's begin. Hi, welcome to 1982. Oh, you don't want to be here? Too bad. You're kind of stuck. I really need to begin with time stuck. Uh, for people who saw my poll on Tumblr, I need to say, I am sorry. I don't know why I left it off the poll. I just forgot. I think it's one of those polls that is so ubiquitous in my mind with the concept of Gravity Falls alternate universes that I just didn't put it on or double check and make sure that I had it on because of course I added it to the poll. It's Time Stuck. Oh, if I could turn back time. So Time Stuck is an AU in which Mabel, but sometimes Dipper depending on the artist's take on it, or sometimes both of them, either by accident or with intent, ends up using the time travel measuring tape to go back to 1982. In that time, they help out a homeless Grunkle Stan, they stop Ford from falling to the portal, or both. The AU was created originally by user Dodo Fiasco on Tumblr, and then popularized by the Snaggers fic Five Minutes Older. Which, by the way, fantastic fanfiction. Read it if you haven't. By the way, the Snadger is one of those OGs of the Gravity Falls fandom on Tumblr. Between them, Scribe Findigal, uh, Jehesselbrom, formerly the Four Twin, Impish Nature, Subpar Go, Silvo Knight, Moon Turtle, um, Minstrel Fox, Doubting Salmon, Ill Doctor, Kiki Kit, Skittle Skew, I, the list goes on and on. Here, I'll put a bunch of names on the screen. But these names are gonna come up more than a couple times this week, and some of them multiple times in this video because they genuinely defined an era of Gravity Falls fanfiction and fan art and just fandom in general. But we're talking about Time Stuck right now. In the most popular iterations of Time Stuck, Mabel ends up meeting Stan, who at the time is homeless, has a mullet, he chain smokes, he lives in his car, and worst of all, he's tangled up with the mob. She convinces him to go to Oregon because, hey, she's from the future and she really needs a scientist who can look at her time machine. And I don't know, Stan. Do you know anyone like that? Do you know any scientists who might be able to help me with this machine? Maybe they look a lot like you. Maybe they live in Oregon, who knows? <laughs> it ends up being this really adorable grunkle and grand niece like car trip adventure. They have this dynamic where they're scamming people across the country, him with his wits and her with her cuteness. They're just picking pockets and making their way to Oregon. And we also get to see this very protective dynamic from Stan who at the time, does not know that Mabel was his great granny. She just appeared in a flash of light in front of him and he couldn't keep this kid on the streets. And she just keeps talking about how she wants to go back to her twin brother. And I don't know about you, but I could think of a couple reasons where Stan might want to reunite someone with a long lost twin. But this is one of those interesting things that the AU establishes that we'll see multiple times in this video. Um, essentially, this protective new dad dynamic where suddenly a grunkle comes in possession of a child and now needs to be a father figure when they weren't expected to do it before. It's always very fun. The Gravity Falls fandom loves to do this with these old men. They also sometimes do this with Ford in Time Stuck. Sometimes he needs to take care of Mabel or sometimes he needs to take care of Dipper if Dipper is who appears at his doorstep. But it'll also happen in another AU that we'll talk about later. Variations of this AU include the rules of time travel, like what will happen when Mabel does save the Grunkles? Will Mabel disappear? Will Dipper and Mabel cause a future to happen where Dipper and Mabel don't exist? Will a new timeline branch out? Do they need to go to that timeline? Will they ever even be able to go back? Do they sometimes cause the events of the portal to happen? This also gives the fandom a chance to play around with the concept of Mabel and Ford hanging out because we are desperate for Mabel and Ford to hang out. More on this later. It's just a very cute and fluffy AU. Like almost every iteration I've seen of it gives the Stan twins a happy ending. It gives them a second chance. What can I say? Anything's possible with the power of love and the power of Mabel. This AU is a fan favorite for a reason. I'm sorry it wasn't on the poll. So yeah, let's talk about the next one. 
So the Monster Falls AU is an interesting case. It's probably the closest thing on this list to an established fanon genre of alternate universe. Like different series and fandoms will have AUs similar to characters turned into monsters. But there are still some specifications that make this one unique. The plot of Monster Falls wasn't created by any one artist, but a group of artists. Each of the artists were credited with forming a different faction of this AU. And you can see those names on the FAQ on user Winterbolt's account. Uh, I'll post a screenshot here. I'll also say that I don't think anyone included here takes ownership of this AU. Like, it's pretty much treated as public domain. As is kind of the case with all of the AUs on this list. The AUs just kind of become part of the public lexicon. So what happens in this universe exactly is, well, everyone does become a monster. It takes place around the time of Gideon Rises, and the gist of the plot associated with it is that Dipper has run out of the shack and falls into a magical pool of furification water, and he turns into a deer centaur. A servitor. There's this established idea of a chain of command where like Dipper interacts with Mabel, who interacts with Stan, who interacts with Seuss, and the magical pool of water, you know, furry juice goes from one person to the next in a game of furry telephone. Dipper becomes a centaur, Mabel becomes a mermaid, Stan becomes a gargoyle, Seuss becomes a homunculus, so on and so forth. And no one should be complaining about how basic the premise is, when it results in some of the coolest art that I've seen in this fandom. Honestly, I saw this animation and several others from like 2014, and they still blow me away. At the end of the day, if you give artists an opportunity to draw characters in a cool way, they won't disappoint. If that 2014 date made you raise your eyebrows, you might be thinking, well, what about Ford? How does he play into this AU? Well, this AU definitely predates the I guess, official canonization of Ford in the series. But that just means that Ford was retroactively assigned a cryptid after he became discovered, and he is most commonly shown as turning into a sphinx or a griffin. Let me tell you, the furries of Tumblr went off with his fucking design. It looks so cool. Not that there's anything wrong with being a furry. Not that there's anything wrong with that. No, of course not. <laughs> I mean, it's fine if that's who you are. Absolutely. I mean, I have many- Furry. Friends. My father's- A furry. Another interesting detail about why specific cryptids were chosen and kind of became standardized across people using the Monster Falls tag, though that isn't always the case, we'll get back to that, is that the characters turn into a monster that kind of reflects their personality. Like, Dipper turns into a servitor because he's anxious and jittery, you know, like a newborn deer. Stan becomes a gargoyle because of his stony exterior despite being full of life and the fact that he watches guard over everyone. Mabel becomes a mermaid because she's a girl. <laughs> Though I will say, sometimes she also turns into a unicorn. There are also some design elements that kind of got standardized across different artists' work. Like for example, Dipper supposedly has spots in the shape of the Big Dipper. I've never felt personally very strongly about this AU, if I'm being honest, outside of seeing how cool the art is. Like, the plot never grabbed me. It is very much they fall into magic and magic happens to them. And that's fine. You know, it doesn't need to be that complicated. I can't help but feel a little bit disappointed by how thin the story is by the people who've adopted this AU. Like, when you have a character like Ford, whose whole personality is almost completely dictated by the fact that he feels like a freak, an outsider, a monster, and then you turn him into a monster, well, you know... The angst writes itself, except it doesn't, and not a lot of people seem to be writing that angle. <laughs> or at least not enough people for my liking. But like I said, the ability to generate cool art is what gives this AU staying power. And this AU definitely has staying power. It was the most popular AU on the list on that poll, despite being much older and much less relevant to current fandom discussions. This AU's fan art has shaped the landscape of Gravity Falls Tumblr. Love it or hate it, it generated some really cool imagery. Not to mention, and I think this is really cool, this AU is one of two fandom AUs that were referenced in the Mabel Pocket Dimension spread in the story Don't Dimension It in the Gravity Falls comics Lost Legends. The artist, Kiki Kit, a uh, real name Serena Hernandez, is an artist from Gravity Falls Tumblr who I'm a big fan of. And she ended up drawing Mabel as this, like, siren form and as a centaur form. 
specifically as a Monster Falls reference going by this post. So yeah, cool imagery, iconic impact, even with a thin story. I know that Time Stuck has a really cool like story-driven quality to it, and that does apply to a lot of the AUs on this list. But sometimes it doesn't need to have an intense plot. Sometimes it's fine if it's just Gravity Falls but furry. Again, not that there's anything wrong with being a furry. I mean, I'm not a furry. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Not at all. Okay, I have a few Sonic OCs. That doesn't make you a furry. Okay, yeah, I have a Pony Sona too. Doesn't everyone? All right, I have a mild obsession with Rum Tum Tugger from the Cats musical. But can you blame me? Yeah. That doesn't make me a furry, right? Right? Yeah. <sighs> Let's move on. So next on the list, in order of which AUs were most popular according to that Tumblr poll, uh, is Reverse Falls. It is what it says on the tin. The roles are reversed. It's opposite land. That's why everyone's so blue bada bee bada bye. Going by research done by that GF fan's timeline posted on Reddit, I'll link it below, the original Reverse Falls AU was created by user Hot Dog Boyfriend. That account no longer exists, and it might have been moved to Seuss Ramirez on Tumblr, but that account also doesn't exist, so who's to say? But that is our best guess. In Reverse Falls, the heroes of the main series were reversed with the main villains. That's right, Gideon and Pacifica. Now, if that is surprising to you that Gideon and Specifica are chosen as the main villains of the series, you gotta remember that the landscape of the fandom in Season 1 was very different from it in Season 2. We as a fandom were not sure what role Bill Cipher would have in the main series. Hell, not even the creators of the show knew what kind of role Bill Cipher would have in the main series. There's DVD commentary clips of Alex Hirsch saying we didn't know that Bill Cipher was gonna be the big baddie. He knew that the show might end in an apocalypse before he knew who would cause the apocalypse. At this yeah. point, we did not know he was for sure the big bat. No, totally. Um, we were still figuring that out. We give Alex Hirsch and the team a lot of credit, and we should. The show was incredible, but it was kind of hanging on by a thread. My main point is that aside from Bill Cipher being an interesting little chaos boy, we had no way of really knowing just how prominent he would be in the series. Not counting the Zodiac that he appears in at the end of the theme song, a symbol which wasn't even planned to be a big part of the series until the very end, Bill Cipher was only in one episode by the end of season one. But Pacifica had been prominent in at least three, and Gideon had been prominent in the A or B plots of at least five episodes. And you'll remember that even though one of the biggest moments of season one was the episode Dreamscapers, it wasn't the finale. Gideon Rises was. So yeah, Gideon and Pacifica were the roles that were reversed with Dipper and Mabel. Let's begin with Pacifica Northwest. Or rather, Pacifica Southeast. Because, um... Because they're reversed. She's got these bright pink, sometimes 80s themed outfits, similar to the 80s themed outfit that Mabel shows up in in the episode Double Dipper, the first episode to feature Pacifica. And according to the Reverse Falls wiki, she has a pet chicken named Clux. Though, I don't know. I've never seen this man. I do not know anything about Clux. Meanwhile, our Dipper character is occupied by Gideon Pines. That's right, Gideon Pines, not Gleeful. He's a Pines now. His entire lineage is different, and that's okay. What's interesting is that even though Gideon and Pacific are, are the good guys in this AU, they are not the centerpiece, not even a little bit. The real stars are Dipper and Mabel Gleeful, the twins of the Tent of Telepathy. Yeah, they got Gideon's gig. I guess in this AU, they came across the amulet that Gideon uses first, and they just like, do evil now. They're just evil. And they have completely new designs too. Mabel in this fan art is depicted as like having the super long hair and you know I, I wanted to complain about how crazy long these hairstyles are but I mean I guess technically they go down to her thighs or knees in the show though I do think that's more a stylistic choice y'all. I'm just like I guess. In most fan art, Mabel is depicted as being super stylish. She has like these blue blazers. Uh, they have like the same blue color scheme as Gideon. And she's also shown in like this like 
stage leotard that she wears during the Tent of Telepathy performances. Yeah, I don't like that. She she is 12, y'all. She's 12. She's 12. She's baby. She's a child. She's an infant. But forget about her design. Let's talk about her personality. Mabel, um, she's not like other girls. Oh, Mabel, there's a darkness inside her. The plot of Sonic Adventure 2 really effed her up. Some might call her twisted, and honestly, some nights, she scares herself. Mabel is shown to be like, you know, this just evil child, which we love to see it. She is mean, she is vain, she is self-centered. She is everything that Pacifica Northwest is shown to be, but also she does murder sometimes. Like, depending on who is drawing this or who is writing this, she's just genuinely, like, just, she kills people. And sometimes she kills people with the help of her brother, Mason Dipper Gleeful. Mason also has this like, you know, blue car scheme. They both have a suit. Though notably, he is not in the sparkly little leotard on stage. He is just in a suit. Both of the twins in this AU are shown to have some kind of deep-rooted anxiety that they never let anyone see. Um, no one can know that they have this weak side. Sometimes people will give them a traumatic backstory to explain why they are now evil. Though notably, a lot of people in this AU will make Mabel the more evil one. Like, Dipper has more anxiety and it just kind of becomes a bit more of a softer character. Even in Reverse Falls, Mabel is seen by select members of the fandom as the evil twin. There is no escaping. Again, they are 12. Is that a fly? Is there just a fly buzzing around for this section of the video? Whatever, it's... It's this fly's house. I'm just living in it, I guess. Notably, Reverse Dipper is shown to be more confident than his canon counterpart. Like, he'll have his birthmark on display. He's not as self-conscious about stuff like that. But now that we got those two out of the way, we got to talk about the real centerpiece of this AU. That's right. It's the soft boy triangle in the room, Will Cipher. <laughs> That's right. William, the opposite of Billiam. <laughs> Will Cipher is sad, soft boy Bill Cipher. Will Cipher is Bill Cipher crying in the therapy session. Will Cipher is Bill Cipher, except he would apologize to you if you kicked him for dirtying your shoes. Will Cipher is Bill Cipher if his initials stood for beta cuck. He's just a sweet little guy. He's just a little guy and it's his birthday. He's just a shy little cutie pie who speaks with a stutter that you would expect a teenager to write in the dialogue of a character who is a shy little cutie pie. And there's nothing wrong with that, ooh I I know I'm making fun of this a little bit and, and I'm gonna stop because genuinely, I do love how fandomy it is. It, it is, it is very Tumblr in 2013, 2014. The crux of Will's whole deal is that he was tricked by the twins into helping them. They summoned him, and now he's their servant. That's like crazy. It's like the opposite. And that's why his name is Will, because B is the opposite of W. At the end of the day, this AU is just teenagers having fun, and it's a delight. But wait, what about Stan and Ford? Well, Stan is an interesting case because I've seen a few different characterizations of him in this AU. One popular version is that he's kind of a Bud Gleeful character. I think I've seen this mostly from Cyrilly. He's a nice, affable guy who takes in Pacifica and Gideon. In some versions though, he's a Bud Gleeful character in the sense that he cannot control these kids he's taking care of. The same way that Bud Gleeful cannot control Gideon, Stan struggles to keep the twins in check and he just kind of gets roped into their schemes. I've also seen a version of him that is just like more capitalist and kind of sinister, which I mean, I don't know if that's exactly the reverse of Stan, but I'll take it. You know how in canon our version of Stan is like someone who acts like he doesn't care but secretly deep down he cares? I like to think that reverse Stan is someone who acts like he cares about these twins but he couldn't give a fuck about them. But you might ask, what about Ford? Well, like I said, this AU was developed well before Ford was actually canonized, but he was worked in retroactively as someone who in the 1980s summoned and tortured Will. Move aside, gleeful twins. Your great uncle was torturing Will Cipher before it was cool. And that's why he's so traumatized, woo. By the way, there are some really cool pieces of fan art of Reverse Falls Ford. Um, and a lot of people just kind of ran with the idea of Ford but evil. We love to see it. 
This will be a theme later on. This AU was genuinely interesting because in the responses, we had people who either loved it, like this AU was their lifeblood, or they hated it. There were some people in the replies of my poll that acted like the Reverse Falls AU pushed their mom off a cliff. As for my thoughts, I think this AU is fun. It definitely generates a lot of really rad artwork, but I don't really know if it stood the test of time. Still, the wiki does have this photo of Seuss. So truly, best shit I've ever seen. 10 out of 10 AU. Okay, let's move on to something a bit more wholesome, shall we? So, Relativity Falls sparks joy. The AU, which was created by Tumblr user Doodles, is basically where Stanley and Stanford switch places in the narrative with Dipper and Mabel. Like, they are 12-year-old kids going up to Oregon to visit their great-aunt Mabel, who secretly has a long-lost twin brother named Dipper, Mason Pine, stuck in an alternate dimension. Ford and Stan are the ones who discover Journal 3, and like, other characters in, the, in this AU also get like, a generational swap thing, like Seuss and Abuelita switch, sometimes um, Wendy and uh, Manly Dan switch, sometimes McGucket is there, but he's like, the Seuss character. Uh, and they all have their own spot in this AU, depending on who's writing it. The only characters that are really set in stone as far as who they're swapped with are Dipper and Mabel and Stan and Ford. Everyone else, it's free game. This AU is an oldie but a goodie. I know that it gained a lot more traction after the series ended, but as soon as it was created, I knew it was something special. And when I say oldie but a goodie, I, I mean it. It was fresh out of a towel of two stand. In fact, the FAQ on the blog, the um, like explanation of what the AU is, kind of has wordings like, hey, don't watch this if you haven't seen a towel of two stands. And one of the main questions is, Who's Stanley? Like I said, this AU was first created by user Doodles, who has since either changed blogs or deactivated, uh, but it was popularized further by user Gargunk on Tumblr. Now, there are some questions in this AU as far as how the nitty gritty details work. Like, in a tale of two stands, Stan pretends to be his long lost twin brother for 30 years, so how does that happen in this AU? Well, in some cases, it doesn't. Like, Mabel doesn't really pretend to be this old scientist that lived in the woods, or she does, but nobody knew who Dipper was. Uh, you know, there are some questions about it because Mabel's a girl and Dipper is a boy. Like, would she be able to pretend to be him? But also, a lot of iterations of this AU feature one of them being trans, or even both of them being trans. But in a lot of cases, the idea is that no one in the town knew anything about this secret scientist in the woods, so they didn't even know his gender. So Mabel's able to just fulfill the role pretty easily. There's also a lot of cool stuff with Mabel's backstory. I've seen a version of this where she like worked in Vegas for the mob in an art forgery ring. Like that's cool. But that's not really the centerpiece of this. Like Gronti Mabel is great, but I think the main appeal of Relativity Falls is the fact that Stanley and Stanford get to go visit Gravity Falls as kids. The 30 years of trauma that we see unpacked in the show hasn't happened to them yet. They have a chance for a happy future and they get to interact without this like angst in your heart knowing that it's all gonna go to shit one day because it already went shit. It just didn't happen to them. <laughs> Sometimes they even make it into a mystery trio thing where Fiddleford is there and he's just another kid their age. So we get this adorable, like, 12-year-old group, this 12-year-old mystery trio. It's just the cutest thing you can imagine. One of the reasons why Relativity Falls is really interesting is because it explores the differences between the older Grunkles and the younger ones. Despite a lot of gift sets that you see of, like, comparisons between Mabel and Stan and Ford and Dipper, um... You know, they are different characters, and the way that they interpret the events of the series through these new characters is always really fun. For example, in the episode Scaryoki, instead of Dipper accidentally summoning zombies, you have this exchange where maybe Stan and Ford purposefully do it to get out of karaoke. It's just a good way of showcasing what the differences are and how these two are a bit more of a chaotic bunch. I'll also say that the art for this series is just absolutely fucking amazing. There are some very cute animatics and drawings and great designs. Shakelin, attack! Go Shakelin! Go Roomba! There are also tons of fantastic designs for Gronti Mabel. Like, so many different artists have given their take on how, like, this 
fun, bubbly exterior mashes with the old ladiness of Gronzy Mabel. It's just, it's just good. This AU lends itself to a lot of cool art from like mashups with other AUs, like a Monster Falls relativity, or even just explorations of different characters when they get older. What are Candy and Grenda like as adults? At the end of the day, I'm just happy to have more content with Kid, Stan, and Ford. I mean, Lost Legends had some, and that was wonderful, I love that comic, but you read it the whole time knowing how their story ends. Yeah, it's um, it's good shit. Okay, next day you. Hey, how's it going? I'm a demon now. You can tell because the hat. So Transcendence AU is very difficult to talk about just because there's so much of it. There's just a lot of AU to go over and I'm going to try to nutshell this, but I don't know how successful I'm going to be. If I had to summarize it in a nutshell, I would say that the Transcendence AU is one in which Bill Cipher dies during an apocalyptic event and Dipper takes over, becoming the next big dream demon. There's more to it than that and we'll get into it, but I need to say, I always feel kind of bad about how little I know about Transcendence. It was one of the first AUs I was technically exposed to. It was created in 2014 by Zoe Chu, one of the mods on the Transcendence AU Tumblr blog. So it's been around for a while, but every time I began to interact with it, I just, there was just, it was just so dense. It kind of went something along the lines of like, who's Henry? I didn't even know where to begin and I didn't know who half of the characters were. So I'm going to begin off the gate by saying that it's a little bit inaccessible, but despite its perceived inaccessibility, it does have a wiki, so I'm going to try to spell this out the best I can. The Transcendence AU begins with The Transcendence, which was an apocalyptic event put in place by Bill Cipher in which all of the weirdness and gravity falls kind of becomes released to the rest of the world. However, the Pines defeat him. They form a small ragtag group that takes him down, and in his dying breath, he attempts to survive by possessing Dipper. The thing is that he tries to do it without a deal, and it seems like there are very hard rules about whether or not that's possible. It was a risk, and it didn't pan out. He died. However, because he died possessing Dipper, some of his characteristics and powers were passed on to him. And now, Dipper is a dream demon, commonly known in the series as Alcor. Most commonly, but depending on who is writing it, Alcor exists in the mindscape only, similar to the way that Dipper's kind of spirit existed in sock opera. I'll also note, they weren't able to stop the transcendence. Like, it happened. Weirdness is all over the world now. Everyone knows that demons exist, as well as every other monster, and someone needs to keep it in check. Alcor, now with his newfound powers, kind of commits himself to it. He can be summoned the same way that Bill can, and oh, he has like a sum- fuck. I forgot the summoning wheel, one second. There, he has a summoning wheel. It looks like this. <laughs> he is summoned and he's called upon to help deal with people's problems. So when he and Mabel go back home at the end of the summer, which they do, which I guess they have school or something, though you'd think the apocalypse would prevent that. Dipper and Mabel's parents now need to deal with their son being a demon, which I guess upsets them a bit. But I guess when they go home, their parents, like, hate them now because he's a demon. So they go back to the mystery shack and live with Grunkle Stan. Meanwhile, like I said, Dipper is a demon now so he can be summoned by people. And he is. They call him to make deals similar to how Gideon did at the end of season one. While that's happening, Mabel meets Henry Corduroy. Um, he is, in this canon, Wendy's cousin, and they fall in love, and they eventually get married, and they have three kids, Acacia, Willow, and Hank, which, <laughs> one of those names is not like the other. Uh, and they're usually depicted as red-headed, you know, like, like the corduroys. Mabel also joins the fight against the cultists. Oh? Oh, you want to hear about the cultists? This is my biggest problem with the wiki, is whenever I'm reading a character description, it goes into the history of the character, it talks about what happened, where they came from, and then it's like, and now they fight cultists, and I couldn't figure out why there are cultists. Why are there cultists? Why are they culting? <laughs> you want to know what the wiki says about cultists? It says, a cult is a group of people that worship a demon, and that's all it says. But yeah. There's cultists. Mabel joins the fight to kill them. She uses a baseball bat called the Colt Basher. 
She also goes by a different name, the name Mizar, which is like a star name, similar to Alcor. They're both like based in astronomy. But the good times don't last forever. Mabel eventually dies. And that's where the plot of Transcendence actually begins. It's not about all the shit I just mentioned. It is about Dipper finding reincarnations of Mabel, Henry, the kids, etc. And like finding them across time because now he's immortal and he is forced to walk this putrid earth without his family and friends forever. It's as angsty as it sounds, but it's also really fascinating. Like, I, I can't get enough of this. And Mabel isn't the only main character to get reincarnated. Bill Cipher does as well. He eventually becomes this guy named Ian, who is dating someone who is also a reincarnation, the reincarnation of Mabel. Bill Cipher is back, and he is just a guy. <laughs> now you might be wondering about Stanley and Stanford. Well, Stanley basically transforms the Mystery Shack into, you know, cult-destroying headquarters. Him and the rest of Mabel's family, who go on, by the way, to have their own kids. Like, it's like a huge family tree. Um, they kind of are headquartered there, and they fight demons. And Dipper also lives there, and at least until he's summoned to do occasional deals with people. I find that the summoning aspect makes the most interesting fanfictions, at least from someone on the outside going in. You don't need to know who Henry and Hank are to enjoy a good fic about some desperate guy making a deal with a demon. Like, it doesn't matter what AU or what story or what canon. Stories about people making deals with demons are rad. They fuck. I'm sorry. I don't make the rules. It's why I'm obsessed with Stanford Pines. Speaking of Stanford, he was not made canon until after this AU was well established, but he is worked in retroactively. Stanford Pines is still a paranormal investigator, and he was still the one who made the Mystery Shack, and he also still went through the interdimensional portal for 30 years. Now, accounts differ on how it exactly happened, but he does come back either around or shortly after the Transcendence. And when he does, he meets Dipper, and he can't stand the kid, because this is Bill. He's a demon now, guys. Why can't you see he is evil? Look at him. I'm sorry, the kid that you loved is gone. This is a Bill Cipher. This, this is a Bill Cipher. This is a straight up Bill Cipher, and I don't trust him. Though, usually, he eventually grows to trust Dipper. Like, Dipper proves himself. And, like, I, I mean, I don't blame Ford in this. Like, yeah, I don't know if I would trust anyone with glowing yellow eyes either. This AU is so many things all at once, and that works to its benefit and also to its detriment. It's a little bit unfocused, it's a bit hard to keep track of. Shout out to that motorcycle going by. But if you want something about long lost siblings reuniting, then you have the reincarnation angle. If you want something about fighting bad guys with a baseball bat, you have the cult basher angle. If you want something about making deals with a demon, you have the Alcor being summoned with a fucking summoning circle angle. He's also summoned with an incantation. I found a few different versions of it, but this one's my favorite. From the depths of hell, by the power of all that is unholy, I call upon the twin star, warper of reality and bringer of chaos, Alcor. This is where I would put like a lightning flash and those kinds of effects, but you know, I don't want to need to need to put a straw warning on this. I want this video to be accessible. There are probably things about this AU I missed. You know, like I said, my first interaction with it was very telling. It was the equivalent of like, I ain't reading all that. I'm happy for you though, or I'm sorry that happened. <laughs> okay, next AU. Let's talk about the Blind Faith AU. So the Blind Faith AU was developed by Gravity What and Snadger in a collaborative effort where they would go back and forth and add stuff to the AU. It was later popularized by Pines in the Woods in their fic, Blind Faith. And this one's a bit of a doozy, so mind the content warnings, I suppose. To understand this fic, you need to go back to the era that it came from. This was before Journal 3 came out. And the only information that we had on what was on the other side of the portal was that it apparently made Ford into this cool sci-fi badass, 
but also that it was what drove McGucket into making the memory gun. Notably, this would change in Journal 3, and they would instead retcon it into saying that McGucket created the memory gun because of the Grimoblin incident that was described in Journal 3. But before then, the only context that we had was that whatever McGucket saw on the other side of the portal was so bad that it destabilized him completely to the sense that he needed to make the memory gun just to cope. So with that in mind, this was an AU where on the day of the portal incident where Ford falls through, Stan also falls through with him. Now, a bit of info on this is that Ford lost his glasses when he went through the other side of the portal, as we saw in Italchu stands. And at the time, we didn't have the journal to let us know that he conveniently had a second pair of glasses. So now that we've set the scene, let's describe the events. Ford and Stan fall through the interdimensional portal. Ford doesn't have his glasses. Whatever eldritch beast on the other side of the portal that drove McGucket to insanity is only appearing to him blurry. He doesn't see much of anything, but he can hear voices, and he is surrounded, from what he could tell, by eyes on every surface. What he immediately does is he puts his hand over Stan's eyes, and he tells him, you can't look. Whatever this is really messed up my assistant, and I can't have you look at this. And he puts a blindfold around Stan's eyes, and he guides him out the other end of the cave. But that being said, he is still kind of seeing what's going on, and it is slowly but surely having its impact on him. He is getting paranoid. He is getting jumpy. He is terrified. He's not able to sleep. And this whole time, Stan has a blindfold on, and he's not able to see. Well, you see, Stan keeps saying, hey, bro, let me take off my blindfold. Let me help you through this fucking cave. Obviously, you're having a tough time. But Ford knows that Stan, with his perfect 20-20 vision, it doesn't matter, that Stan, <laughs> if he gets a look at whatever is on the other side of this portal, it's gonna mess with him. And so, in a manic bit of paranoia, Ford does the only thing he can think of. Depending on who is writing this, and depending on how the story exactly goes, sometimes Stan only loses one eye. Sometimes Ford just stabs through it with a pen. Sometimes he loses both his eyes, blinded with a piece of wood from their campfire. Regardless, by the end of the fic or the story, we have the main setting. Stan and Ford, with Stan blinded either partially or completely, need to make their way through the multiverse and survive. Defending and protecting each other, despite going through this pretty fucked up situation. The conceit of the AU is that Ford blinded his brother, yes, but he only did so because he was really not doing well. He was hanging on by a thread. And Stan needs to forgive his brother, and he always does. Sometimes the fix follow the actual events that I just described, and sometimes fix in this AU take place afterwards. Sometimes Stan starts to get his sight back, too. It just kind of all depends on who's writing it. Now, this AU is a lot of people's first AUs. It really drew in a lot of people. It had really good writers in the beginning. Like, you know, the Pines in the Woods fic is one of my favorites. That being said, I have seen versions of this AU that come across as very ableist. Like, Stan and Ford will have conversations where Stan's like, I'll never see again. I feel useless and awful and I'm really just a burden. And it's like, oof. I don't, I, you know, I, I just don't think that's very good. <laughs> like, come on, guys. That's not a good way to talk about blind people. That being said, the events that I described are very, I mean, they're pretty edgy. They're very dark, they're kind of violent, and it is very easy for fix and comics about this to kind of come across as like, hey, what if two guys were stuck in a cave and one of them hit the other guy in the eye with a rock? Wouldn't that be fucked up or what? Um, it, it just kind of depends on who is writing it and how they handle the source material. But still, this is like a staple. It's one of the original AUs where Stan falls through the portal. The other one I'm thinking of, of course, is the reverse portal AU by Busket. In this one, Ford doesn't fall through at all. It's only Stan. That happens in a couple of AUs. There's also a portal swap AU. There's a Stan swap AU. Um... I think Jinju's Tonic has one called the Big Shot AU, I'm not sure. 
There is another genre of these where Stan and Ford both fall through, but we'll talk about that later. But yeah, Blind Faith is a classic for a reason. It's no wonder why people resonate with this. I mean, if one, it focuses on the older Stan twins, which, I mean, they're kind of the fan favorites. Sorry, Dipper and Mabel. But also really focuses on, you know, themes of trust and betrayal and needing to forgive someone after doing something that you might see as unforgivable. It actually fits pretty well in with the series as a whole when you look at it that way. That being said, if you have a Blind Faith AU comic and you don't put alt text on it or descriptions on it, like, if you have anything and you're dealing with blind characters, like, make it accessible. Next AU. Let's talk about Drifting Stars. So you need to understand for this section that in 2015, 2016, we were desperate for any kind of interaction between Ford and Mabel because that's one of the places where the show really fell flat. The series ended without giving any of those moments and like, I'm not one of those people who needs a season three of Gravity Falls. Like I'm not in Al Search's ats about it. You know, I think it ended in a perfectly fine place the end of the summer. I'm always glad that we didn't get like another summer or any kind of epilogue, you know, like he didn't do the thing that JK Rowling did where it like skips forward 12 years into the future and we find out who the twins married and how many kids they have and Dipper looks at his son and says, Grunkle Stan, Grunkle Ford Pines, you're named after the two bravest men I know. Like, I've always been happy that Alex knew when to cut it off, when to end it. But that doesn't mean that I don't wish we had, like, an additional two or three episodes just to flesh out Ford and Mabel's relationship and, you know, give us a few other plot points. Come on, just, just one episode. You, you could even fit in the Wendy B-plot episode where she learns how to shoplift from Grunkle's dad. You know, the one that Alex described? Have that as the B-plot of the episode. Come on, it writes itself. One of the biggest losses of the fact that we didn't have a Ford and Mabel bonding episode is that it gave the impression to a lot of people for some reason that Ford hates Mabel, which just canonically isn't true. Like the first words that Ford says to Mabel are, <laughs> I like this kid. She's weird. But the series didn't give us enough. So I guess we got to do it ourselves. So if you have an AU where in not what he seems, Mabel falls through the interdimensional portal and is picked up by Ford. Well, I guess if they're the only two people, they have no choice but to bond, huh? This AU, uh, developed by the subpar ghost uh, and also popularized by a fic by the Mad Queen Mab, is another reoccurrence of that trope I mentioned earlier, the sudden dad trope, where all of a sudden one of the grunkles has a child that he has to take care of. And this AU just fully just it just does so much with it. Mabel falls through and she doesn't know who her grunkle is. Because remember, we don't get the whole like backstory dump that we get in A Tale of Two Stands and not what he seems. She doesn't even know if her grunkle is her grunkle. Grunkle Stan, I don't even know if you're my grunkle. And she ends up in some hostile environment. Uh, this is before Journal 3 came out, so we didn't know that it led directly to the Nightmare Realm. But, but even so, she ends up in some hostile environment and Ford just needs to take her under his wing. He finds out that he has a niece now. She sees him and she's like, why do you have Stan's face? And he's like, what? And she's like, yeah, but his name is Stanford. And he's like, the hell it is. And it's always so good. <laughs> there are a few different takes of this AU and some she falls through and she just has to fend for herself until she's a teenager. There are some where she ends up on the other side of the portal for like a year before she's brought back by Stan and Dipper. Um, because they got to rebuild the portal in the meantime. And that's another thing that can be developed and fixed and often is Dipper has just lost his sister and he at this point does not trust Stan. So he and Stan have like these big arguments about, oh man, it just, it's so good. But it also has like this really adorable side where Mabel gets to explore the multiverse with her great uncle Ford. This, this AU has everything. You can tell I have a lot of love for this AU. Also something notable about this AU is this was the second AU that was kind of made canon, canon, by Kiki Kit in that Mabel spread in the Don't Mention It comic. We see a version of Mabel with like this cloak and her hair cut short 
Uh, this often happens in these fics. Uh, Mabel gets her hair cut short to keep her safe from, you know, any kind of grabby monster. That's usually how you can tell, oh, this is a drifting stars Mabel, as if she has like this little cute bob. But yeah, Kiki Kit made it canon right next to Monster Falls AU. You know, Kiki Kit doesn't get enough credit for what they contributed there. There are other artists who worked on the Lost Legends series, uh, mainly the one who made the first story. And she's just a turf now. She's just her whole, she deleted everything off of their blog. Like it's just transphobia. Wild shit. <laughs> I know I said I wouldn't call anyone out, but then I'm calling one person out. I'm allowed. But yeah, Drifting Stars is just, it's adorable. Now on the other hand, we have Grifting Stars. Grifting Stars is kind of a spin-off of Drifting Stars, and it's one in which Stan falls through the portal in Not What He Seems instead of Mabel, or really instead of just Ford coming back. Now, this is a bit different from Blind Faith and Reverse Portal because both of those have Stan falling through in 1980-something. But in this one, he falls through in the 2010s and he just needs to get along with a Ford who has been jaded by the last 30 years of interdimensional travel. He needs to look Ford in the eyes, a man who said, I told you not to open this and they need to get along and they need to find a way back. And they definitely need to find a way back because Dipper and Mabel are fending for themselves. In this, Ford gets to hear from Stan about how he has a niece and nephew waiting for him. Now, there's a lot of different places that grifting stars can go. They can go the route where both of the brothers work together to try to kill Bill. They could go the route where they put all of their energy towards trying to get back home. And this is one of those AUs where we get to see Stan fall through the portal and deal with the multiverse, which is always interesting and always fun, but it doesn't come with all of the blind faith baggage that the blind faith AU comes with, you know? We get a lot more wholesome moments of them just learning how to cooperate. Mainly because, again, they're the last two people on any dimension they're on. They need to get along. <laughs> they have no choice but to bond. Who needs to work on your communication issues when you can get sucked through an interdimensional portal? Men will literally get sucked into a different dimension instead of going to therapy. This AU, Grifting Stars, wasn't as popular as I thought it was when I put it on the poll, which really surprised me. There were more people who said, I hate all of these AUs, than there were people who said, oh yeah, Grifting Stars, that one's my favorite. But it's definitely one of my faves. I wonder if I just thought it was more popular because it was made by two really big people in the fandom, namely Impish Nature and Lightkeeper. Um, those were both two big people in the fandom and they helped develop this AU. I guess at the end of the day, Gravity Falls Tumblr isn't consistently made up of the people who followed these big users back in the day. It's full of these new Zillennial fans who started watching after the 10 year anniversary. Damn kids. Get off my lawn! And, this, and as I mentioned, this AU bears similarities to a few different AUs. It bears similarities to Blind Faith, to Reverse Portal, to Portal Swap, to uh, basically any iteration of the wrong character ending up through the interdimensional portal. And this art really shines when you have, like, you know, a different version of the stands interacting. I didn't mention this when I was filming the Blind Faith section, I forgot to mention this, but in the Reverse Portal AU, like, Stan goes through and Ford does not get him back for another 30 years. And when he does come back, Stan comes back with a prosthetic arm. So there are drawings where you have Stan with like a cool prosthetic arm and also the Grifting Stars AU boys, and also the Blind Faith AU boys, and also Canon Ford interacting in the multiverse. And it's just, it's just a lot of angst to fit into one room, but it's also really good. By the way, just, just a side note, when I was looking on Buskit's blog for stuff about Reverse Stan, I found this post about, hey guys, I think, I think there might be secret messages in this show. Oh man, <laughs> good times. Oh, to be young. <laughs> I wish I could watch the show all over again, man. I wish I could experience this fandom all over again for the first time. Ah, oh, well. Next day, you. <laughs> hey, how's it going? I'm kind of a bad boy now. What are you going to do about it? So, one of us is one of my favorite AUs, and I don't think it's talked about a lot anymore. And that's a damn shame, because it had some really cool art. 
We talked about Monster Falls being really sustained by its cool artwork, and this AU has so much of it, and I'm so upset that it fizzled out and died. The conceit of the AU is, like, you know the part in Word McGinnon when Ford is being held up by Bill, and Bill is holding him in front of his henchmaniacs, and he's like, Oh, look at you. You'd probably fit in amongst one of my freaks. Oh, you? You're a little freak? I bet it would be really funny if you joined us, haha. Ah, uh, don't look so sour, Fordsy. It's not too late to join me. With that extra finger, you'd fit right in with my freaks. This is an AU where Ford goes, yeah, good point, and joins Bill and becomes a demon. <laughs> Ford really just goes, you know? I never considered. You know, now that you put it like that, I guess I'm kind of a bad boy now. Duh. We love to see it. This AU was created by Point Trickster and expanded by Owlpin, I think? It's hard to know. A lot of the blogs that worked with one of us kind of disappeared. So this AU was inspired by a couple of things. One was demons are cool and the designs featuring Demon Ford were rad. There were a few of those kind of floating around, but they exploded with one of us's popularity. And this is the main point of this part. Like, they were just cool. People drawn as demons are cool. Oh, you think I like stories about people summoning demons? What about people becoming demons? My cat's eating. Crunch, crunch, crunch. We just live like this. And a lot of artists got in on it. I mean, even Sovo Knight had a demon Ford. I'm gonna drop a lot of art over here, but there were many, many more. For every one of these designs, there were like five more that featured Ford in some fucked up cool form. I think another thing that really inspired this AU, the AU where Ford just fucks off and joins Bill's side, were the theories that he would. I have a video coming out on this, but late 2015, early 2016 was a wild time to be a fan of Ford because a lot of people didn't like him. <laughs> they didn't trust him. That man came out of the portal and punched Grunkle Stan in the face. I don't trust him as far as I can throw him. <laughs> Listen, Ford, I was rooting for you, but you didn't make it easy. <laughs> That's a lie. I will defend him until my dying breath. But around the time of the finale, this trailer came out showing him, like, in this galaxy. <laughs> Can an ant do this, Ford? <laughs> A lot of people latched onto that image and went, See? I knew it. He was evil. He is gonna join Bill. Ha ha ha! My last seven months of writing anti-Ford essays paid off! <laughs> and on one hand, this was annoying because, again, I was defending Ford to my dying breath and I did not think that he was gonna join Bill's side in the finale. <laughs> but on the other hand, it would kind of be rad if he did. I mean, look at this. <laughs> This AU made an impact on me because of its creativity, because of the wide breadth of the designs, and because of like the either angst angle of, oh man, I need to join Bill's side to save my family, or just the cool fucked up vibes of fuck it, we ball, we're evil now. <laughs> I remember this trailer and the discussion around it so vividly. I mean, in some circles, all people were talking about was the possibility that Ford was evil. In other circles, the only thing people were talking about was Ford being in that blue collar. Gravity Falls fans, man, we know what we're about. <laughs> Whoever cut that trailer knew what the fuck they were doing. <laughs> the main reason I'm talking about one of us is because I want to bring it back. Draw Ford as a demon. Do it and send it to my inbox, please. Thank you. This has been a PSA. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me on this exploration of different Gravity Falls AUs. Um, there were a lot that I didn't get a chance to talk about. You know, the Lightkeeper AU, the Flat Dreams AU. I could have said a lot more about the Reverse Portal and Stand Swap AU. You know, there's Disco Stands, the AU by Jinju's Tonic. There's the Same Coin AU, which began as a theory but kind of became an AU after it was kind of more or less dismissed by Alex Birch. Same deal with Mystery Trail. There's one and a half stands where Stan gets shrunk or de-aged in the 1980s and Ford now needs to deal with everything Ford was going through and also that. There's the 500 Fords AU, which I think was created by Cyrilly, but I distinctly remember it spawning like 
a bunch of people making their own Fords. Like it's essentially the Citadel of Ricks, but Ford. So there were different versions of Ford. I had a version of Ford that wore booty shorts. It was great. There's Depravity Falls, which is just <laughs> Gravity Falls, but what if everyone was fucked up? There's Immortal Pines, which is what if Gravity Falls, but everyone was a god. There's the Grim AU, which is Gravity Falls, but what if Stan had a fucking dog and it was also a Death Omen? There's the Frankenstein AU, and I know that Ginger's Tonic has one that's running now, but Arrow Dude Jude had one back in the day, and both of them kind of have the same concept, which is Stan fucking dies. F. And Ford, with the help of Fiddlefern, have to bring him back in this Frankenstein mystery trio. It's good shit. For every AU I've mentioned, there are dozens more, and they're all great. This fandom is so creative and cool. Uh, I want to give a special thanks to Aragorn and Snadger and Scribe and Mary P. Sue for reblogging things with tags. I was there back in the day, but I did not tag my shit when I reblogged it, and these accounts do, so I was able to actually go back and find a lot of stuff for various AUs that I wouldn't have been able to find otherwise. I also want to thank that GF fan who made a timeline of the Reverse Falls AU, which was instrumental in me putting together that section. And like, I don't think I can convey just how much this process meant to me. To go back and look at the old art and the old fix and do this research and kind of recover all of this content for these things that mattered so much. Like, I know that alternate universes from a specific subset of people on a specific platform for a specific fandom of a 2012 Disney cartoon isn't something that a lot of people care about. But for the people who did care about it, they cared so much. And that's just a beautiful thing, you know? The world will never be worse from people creating art for things that they love. It can only make it better. If you're just now joining the fandom, welcome. There's a ton of great stuff. And if you were there in between 2012 and 2016 when the show was running, um, at the heyday of the fandom, and you saw these things unfold or maybe even contributed to them, thank you for being there. I'm glad to have been there too. Till next time, this is Hannah signing off.